Welcome back, friends, to our study in the book of Hebrews. We are in Hebrews chapter 8, and we are focusing on the new covenant, the new experience that God wants us to have with Him. As we pointed out before the break, there are a number of facets to the new covenant, and each one of them needs to be understood as we, as we move through chapter 8, verses 10 through 13. First of all, we see here, James, that the covenant involves a promise of God that He will write His law in our hearts, in our minds. God will do this. How is it that God is going to bring to pass? How it is, is it that God is going to be the one who fulfills the law or writes it in us? You know, it's really powerful, Ty, because this is just a continuation of the theme that Paul has been building, that the, the immutable promises of God. Mm -hmm. And one of those immutable uh, promises that God has made to us is His Word. He has established His Word as the power and authority by which He can realize or, or make real in our lives everything that He is giving to us, that He is promising mm -hmm. to us. So the Word is powerful, the oath of God is powerful, and it is through His Word that He establishes His law in our hearts. It is through the power, the grace, mm -hmm. the goodness of God that comes through His Word that He establishes the law in our hearts and in our minds. I will put my law in your mind, I will write it on your heart. That's a powerful promise. Mm -hmm. Now, it's important that we understand that this promise is throughout Scripture. Mm -hmm. It's not just a promise that comes to us in the New Testament period. Actually, this is echoing from chapter 36 of Ezekiel, where similar language is used. It says in chapter 36 of Ezekiel, verses 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. I love the fact that God says here, I'm going to cause you, I'm not going to force you, I'm not going to manipulate you. I'm not going to bear over you with any kind of dominance. Rather, I'm going to work from the inside out. I'm going to work on the inside of your being, give you a new heart, a new spirit, a new attitude. Paul says in chapter 2 of Philippians, let this mind or this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. God's going to work on the inside of our hearts, and as a result of that internal change, there's going to be an external change. I will cause you to walk in my statutes and in my law. God's the cause, mm -hmm. but he's doing it through us with our cooperation. Now, I like the latter part of this verse too. Verse 10 says, and I will be to them a God, mm -hmm. and they shall be to me a people. Mm. That is talking about relationship. That's right. This is the theme that we've been building on as we've been moving through the book of Hebrews, relationship. It began in chapter 1. God has spoken to us and He speaks to us through the Son. And He's continued this theme all the way through. Why? Because right here in Hebrews 8, we are kind of coming to a zenith, if you will, a, a, a summary, a, a culmination of the point that Paul is trying to make. Mm -hmm. God wants a relationship with His people. I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. Mm -hmm. He created us in the beginning in His image, and He had that relationship with us from day number one. Sin interrupted this relationship, and God wants to restore the relationship. In other words, the new covenant is not just about, I'm going to put the law in their hearts, and they're, they're going to obey me, and they're going to keep the commandments. Not that dryness that we see sometimes in religianity. It's about experience. It's about love, because the law is based on love. Mm -hmm. It's about God and us coming together in a relationship that honors and respects one another and, and falls in love with one another, and thereby we find ourselves having His law in our hearts and Praise in our minds. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's, that's why we're told, James, in Romans 13, 10, that love is the fulfilling of the yes. law. We're not talking here about a mere code of ethics that we obey with a grudging, unwilling heart, but rather it's an experience that we see reflected in the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ when He said, I do always those things that please God. There is this, this sense, this tone in Jesus in which He longs to please the Father. Amen. He's not merely obeying as a legalistic requirement in order to get on the good side of an angry God, but rather 
What Jesus is bringing to us in the New Covenant is a change of heart, a change of motive, a change of attitude, a change of perception mm -hmm. of God's character such that we begin to incline toward God, to love what God loves, to hate what God hates. Our, our, our tastes, literally, our spiritual tastes, our moral taste is changed by this internal transformation. So this idea that there's a difference between love and law, that law is Old Testament mm -hmm. legalism and what we need today is love, is not biblical. It's a false dichotomy. Yeah, all through the New Testament we find that the essence, the basis of love is the law mm -hmm. or law love. It's the same. In other words, not just in Romans but in Galatians, Paul says love is the fulfilling of the law. Mm -hmm. Jesus was asked once about which commandment was the most important and Jesus said the first commandment, the most important commandment is to love mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. The commandment, the law, is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor. Law, love your neighbor as yourself. When you look at the commandments, you're mm. seeing the mm. essence of love. Mm. This is, love and law go together. This is the biblical idea of love and law, James. In our popular culture, if you listen to the radio on any, any given day or you, you pick up a popular music CD, you're definitely going to hear the word love a lot. In fact, I saw one magazine article that said that they did a search on all the modern popular music and they found that the most frequently used word in popular music is love. And they said that the second most frequently used word in popular guess. music is baby. <laughs> baby, as in baby, I love you. And the third most frequently used word in popular music is yeah, yeah as in oh yeah. So baby, I love you, oh yeah. But that's track one on any given CD. By track two or three, I don't love you, baby, anymore <laughs> because I've moved on to another baby that has been more, you know, more that attractive more. than you that I love more now. And so it looks like modern, the modern perception of love is that love really is self-satisfaction, mm -hmm. but the biblical idea of love mm -hmm. is that love is self-sacrifice. First Corinthians chapter 13 verses yes. 5 through 7 says that love is not self-seeking, or as the King James Version renders it, that love seeketh not its own. And if love's not seeking its own, mm -hmm. if love is not self-seeking, stated in a positive sense, that means that love is other-centered. It is mm -hmm. self-giving. Mm -hmm. That is the biblical idea That's of love. That's the essence of love. Now mm -hmm. we've got law in the New Covenant experience. We've got gospel in the New Covenant experience. We've got power in the New Covenant experience. We've got relationship in the New Covenant experience. We've got anointing in the New Covenant experience. Let's look at this aspect of the gospel. I think it's found here in verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 8. It says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. What is that talking about? Well, these two things need to be joined together, James. The, the law of God being written in our hearts and in our minds and the mercy and forgiveness that God bestows upon us. Whenever I think about the new covenant, I think of the woman caught in adultery in chapter 8 of the Gospel of John and her experience because she personifies a living experience of what the new covenant is all about because Jesus said to her, I don't condemn you. That's forgiveness. That's the mercy aspect of the plan of salvation in the Gospel. Then he said, now go and sin no more. It's futile for us to, to think in terms of going to sin no more mm -hmm. unless we are living in the light of God's non-condemning love for us. That's where the power is. I don't condemn you. Now go in the light of that love that I have for you and sin no more. So a vital aspect of this new covenant experience is the mercy of God, mm. the empowering mercy of God, the grace of God that empowers us to live a different That's life. Right. We cannot have any kind of law put into our hearts, into our minds without recognizing first that God is going to take care of our guilt, that God has taken care of our sins, that He's purged them mm. by Himself, and that the essence of what God is offering us is mercy and acceptance in spite of ourselves. And that empowers us, as it did with this woman caught in the act of adultery. Mm -hmm. It empowers us to go forth and sin no more. Sin being, friends, the transgression of the law, according to 1 John 3, verse 4. But before we get to a revelation of the law of God, we have, as you pointed out in Exodus, we have a revelation of the delivering power of God, of the blood of Jesus Christ written on the doorposts, on the lentils, the, the blood of Jesus Christ that covers us, that forgives us, that is merciful toward us. This is New Covenant theme. 
The next aspect of the new covenant that, that Paul brings to our attention here that we want to focus on is in verse 11, where he says, None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. So here is a personal, intimate relationship with God that each individual has so that evangelistic witness, so to speak, at some point becomes unnecessary because you're already in a personal relationship with God. That doesn't mean we don't testify and share with one another after we have come to Christ and, and, and accepted the gospel, but now we're in a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. We have the anointing of God's Spirit upon us, and God is speaking in our own hearts. You know, this is so powerful because this was a failure in the Old Covenant. When the Old Covenant was given at Sinai, the people were confronted with Moses, whose face was bright and shiny, mm. and when they saw Moses come down from that mountain that was filled with thunder and lightning, and they pulled back and they were scared, they said, they said, Moses, you talk to us. You tell us what God says, but don't have God talk to us anymore. Mm. In other words, they weren't willing to engage in that personal relationship with God. They wanted a mediator. They wanted someone to stand between them and God, a human being to stand between them and God. And we can do the same today, friends, with pastors, with preachers. We can follow people instead of following God. That is not God's purpose for the new covenant. So God wants us personally to engage with Him so that He can teach us personally. So they promised to obey God's law, but they did not enter into a vital living relationship with God that would empower them to actually be able to do it. They were not willing to be personally taught of God. Now mm. this is so powerful in the New Testament. You find this especially in 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2, Paul here, uh, excuse me, John here is speaking about the anointing that we are to have from the Holy One. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 20. Listen to these verses. It says, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. Mm. Now, what's so powerful here is that the truth of the matter is none of us know all things, but the Holy Spirit knows all things, and the Holy Spirit has promised to teach us all things. The Holy Spirit wants us not to become man-dependent. doesn't mean there's not a place for teachers and preachers and pastors. There's a place for them, but we are not to be of Apollo or Cephas or of, Cephas or of Paul. We are to be of Christ. We're to follow Christ. He is the great teacher, and God is promising each of us that we can have this anointing. Mm. We can know Him personally. He can teach us Personally. I really like this word in verse 11 of Ch Hebrews chapter 8, know. Everyone will know the Lord. It shows up a number of places in Scripture, and the first time we see it is in Genesis 4 where Adam knew Eve and she gave birth to a son. It's a word of intimacy. Jesus used the word when he said that eternal life is to know God. Yes. And now Paul uses it and tells us that it's a part of the new covenant to enter into personal intimate relationship with God. The law of God written in our hearts and minds, the gospel of forgiveness, the power of God to empower this relationship, the relationship that we're to have with God so we don't rely on man but we rely on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is the essence, these are the principles of the new covenant experience, of what God is calling us to, of what Paul is pointing us to in Hebrews chapter 8. Is the, this is to be the experience that God wants us to have with Him, that God wants you to have with Him, and He's calling you to that experience right now. Don't neglect it.